All right. So first thing before we begin is I want you to write down what is your definition of art in your process portfolio. Now write all the ideas in bullet points if you want, in sentences if you want, but I want you to leave plenty of spaces around your definition on that page because what we're going to do is we're going to come back throughout the term and we, what we're going to do is we're going to start writing our reflections on what you think it is, what you don't think it is around it. So what we're going to do is we're going to reflect on your initial definition of art. So if you need to, you can pause it from here. Now, this video is going to be in about three sections, I would say. The first part is, let's define what it can be, okay, what art is, what isn't, what it can be, what it can't be. Looking then a, bit, a little bit about the history of it, and then what we're going to also then do is to look at who are the artists, what do artists do, you know, because that's really important, does that define what art is, and then we're going to look a little bit into then um, the other stakeholders, which are um, you know people who are also involved in this art circle, and um, do they also give meaning to what art is? All right. So once you're ready, let's begin. All right. So art has not always have the same meaning. When I say that, it means the actual word itself. So you know, in the 13th century, it just meant it was a skill. So anything that is skill-based from mathematics to medicine that could be considered as an art so you know so just like how you would apply it today you know the art of writing the art of driving you know so it's it's that sort of terminology that we're talking about in the 13th century people didn't really have the concept of what other things art could be so by the time it got to the 16th century the meaning refined a little, so it became things like paintings, drawings, sculptures, and then, you know, you have a lot of these making, you know, with hands, um, that sort of skills, um, that was considered art. So then by the time it got to the 18th century, because there was so much of this skill-based things going on, um, there was a little, um, you know, war, I would say, against, like, you know, people then interpreted, well, what is an artist? What is an artisan? So, you know, there is fine arts versus craft. So this has become, become an idea. And I think this people are still trying to distinct and argue. And I think this has a lot of cultural context at, attached to it as well, because who defined the word, was, what is art, you know? And that, you know, that idea is started to expand um, not only in a Eurocentric sense, um, because that's just the paintings and the drawings and the sculptures, but once you start looking at other cultures, when they start making things like weaving baskets, um, whereas one culture considers it as art, and you take that back into the European, you, you know, Euro Eurocentric view, you know, is that still considered art? So there's big, big, you know, um, movement going on to have this argument over that. When it comes to today, um, the meaning of art has again changed. Um, the boundaries have changed. It's not very clear what it is today. But um, so, what could be considered art one day might not be considered that tomorrow. So, that's some food for thought. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little game with you. Let's start with a little game. What is? Well, what do you think it is? So it's more of a subjective view. Okay, so we can interpret art in many different ways. Can, the cultural ways I just talked about um, a little bit. Um, there's subjective. So let's have a look at that for now. Well, what do you think? What do you think this is? First of all, it's a bit of graffiti. Is this art? Okay. What about this? What is it? Is this art? Some might not consider this as art. This is a bit of a toilet picture that I found. It's a urinal. But then, if that isn't art, then how about this? This is made in 1917, signed with the signature of R. Mutt on it, and it's by a very famous um, Dadaist artist called Marcel Duchamp. And he named this piece The Fountain. And it was very shocking at the time 
um, the diodorist movement, just to give you a little bit of context, is about making works that are nonsense. So dada, like, which means like the word that actually they got came with um, the dada means like uh, it's like little baby talk. That's where the the name of this art movement came from. So it really this is actually the beginning of postmodernism, um, the thought of postmodernism of challenging what art could be. And I want to begin with this piece because this is the foundation of where and how we think of art today and how it can be challenged today. So, so this is the first piece for contemporary art that has been challenged. Um, is this art? So if you saw the graffiti piece before, this perhaps is another graffiti piece. Um, Banksy, perhaps, you might have heard of this name before, is quite a famous British guy, people would say. Um, no one really knows his identity for sure. Some people might think that they have spotted him, but again, this is very controversial because he d he did a lot of works in places that he shouldn't be doing. Um, and graffiti, if you're not doing it in a space where you are given permission to do it, it's actually illegal to, so he can be caught. So, um, so that's why in a lot of his interviews, none of them actually show his face on it. All right, how about this? We all like ice cream. I definitely do, is this art? Well, what about this? Okay, this is by Clay Oldenburg and um, it's a sculpture, it's an outdoor public sculpture um, on top of a building, as you can see, in Germany. So that's another view of it on the side of the building. Well, how, how is this more art than the ice cream cone that we saw before? All right, next one. What about this? Uh huh. So we've all seen these before. This balloon dog. What What do you think? Is this an art? All right. What about this? This is actually by Jeff Koons, who you will see his one of his other public displays in Bilbao in front of the Guggenheim Museum. What do you think? Do you think this is art? How about this? Do you notice anything familiar from this? Okay. This is a commissioned piece. Do you guys understand the word commission? So it's been paid by, so um, in this case, you can see the pattern in the back, it's paid by LV, so Louis Vuitton has paid Takashi Murakami, a famous Japanese contemporary artist um, who does cartoon-ish looking bright things um, and he's commissioned him to create a collaboration with um, LV to create this particular painting so this one's called World of Spheres is this art you can see again his design perhaps on a more traditional LV luggage What about this? It's a scarf, I can tell you that. Again, it's a Louis Vuitton scarf, but in this place it's not a collaboration. It's um, it's taken from one of Sol LeWitt's works and they've printed it on a scarf. So it's taking somebody else's work. And Sol LeWitt was an artist from the 1960s um, it's about minimalism and um, this is a very minimalistic drawing. What about this? This is a shark in formaldehyde, sitting in formaldehyde. Is this art? Okay. The title of this by Damien Hirst is called The Physical Impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. Is the shark dead? It's actually a real shark. They've actually caught off the coast. Um, but what happened was 
in the first prototype, well, it's not even the prototype, in the first artwork, what they've discovered after a few months was that the shark was actually rotting because of the formaldehyde. There was something not right in the chemical. So they had to find a different shark and then put a new one in. So after replacing that shark, is it still the original piece of work? So this is a really interesting question. You can talk about um, originality of artworks, you know, like with solar weed work before that you saw that got transferred, you know, to a piece of scarf, you know, is that still considered art? Well, here, having the original um, shark replaced, is that still considered the original art piece? So that's something for you guys to think about, to argue about, I think. Um, this has always been a very controversial work. Again, this one, it's called, whoop, oh, I don't have the title there, it's called Mother and Calf, um, and it's a cow sawed in half, and this is only one section of it, and then moving, like, next to it is another display of um, the baby cow as well. So what do you think about this? What about this? Is this art? The Mona Lisa. Are you all familiar with the Mona Lisa? Okay, and this is Marcel Duchamp again, the man who made the urinal that we saw before. Um, this is his take on of the Mona Lisa. Is this art? And this is Basquiat's take on. So this is actually the proper word for this is not called take on it's called appropriation so when something's appropriated they take part of an image and they copy it i'm using the word copy very carefully they copy it and they make it into their own they turn it into their own okay so they're not exactly just copying it because that is a very fine line between what is copying and what isn't copying and you can go into lawsuits for it. So for example, um, the balloon dog that I showed you before, not that particular piece of work, but that artist, Jeff Coons, he's been sued in the news many times for appropriating other people's works. Okay. So now before I get into that too much, Let's go back to this one, Bas um, Mona Lisa by Basquiat. So here is um, his take on about um, how much money the art world is making, okay, in, in the 1960s specifically, because this is the golden era, basically, where a lot of people started booming and making money like you're, that you might be familiar with is Andy Warhol you know you churn out a lot of art you start making a lot of money with art so um, this is his social commentary on that all right what about this what do you think this is is this a, it's a goat in a bit of tire sitting on top of a canvas with some other junk on top of it is this art Apparently it is by Russian um, Russian Robert Russianberg. So it's a sculpture, you would say. This one. We'll talk about found objects art in a, in a sec. Okay, and then coming to this one. Have you guys seen this one before? This one's called Blue Poles by Jackson Pollock. So this has been a very, very controversial piece of work in Australia. As you can see, you know, what does it look like? It looks like a lot of paint that's been dripped. Jackson Pollock himself claims that there is a technique to it and he's invented a technique to it. And you know, it's a deliberate act, not just so abstract, but to a lot of people, it looks like it's a bit of an abstract work. So the controversy behind this one is um, it's bought by the Australian government in 1973 for $1.3 million. And, you know, if it's bought by the government, it's bought with taxpayers' money. And the next day, once it's been purchased, um, in the newspaper headlines, it says, would you pay $1.3 million for this? All right, and it was 
printed in large color reproduction on the front page and at the time you know newspaper are usually really in black and white rarely are they printed in color so people were quite um, interested in this issue All right. so and it's a rather large piece of work as well as you can see all right, this is Orlan. Um, what's her? Is she a piece of art herself, I wonder? Um, so do you see the little horns, the little bumps that's inserted into her skin um, near her temples? So what she does is she makes videographs of herself in these operation performances um, and she is the one that goes undergoes the surgery herself and she has these f filmed in a documented form um, what do you think is this art she's a very interesting lady I've had a chance to meet her myself one time um, okay what about this is this art Whoa we're going to be seeing this. This is by Frank Geary. This is the one that I've been telling you about where for him the process, the initial process for him um, to come up with the forms of his architecture are, are to scrunch up pieces of paper, draw some rough designs from it and from there on he works with an engineering team to see how these shapes could be made possible by accident. I ended up watching a documentary on how this building um, was built and it's very very funny it's by Richard Hammond but they talk about all and exp he experiments with all the um, techniques that Frank Geary did as he was building this um, building so maybe we should be watching this in class um, sometime this term what about this what is this is a photography, but is it a realistic photography? So it's a digital manipulated photography by Patricia Piccinini. All right, so again, this is another piece of her work. Actually, yes, this is... Um, actually, sorry. That was by Julie Rapp, not Patricia Piccinini. But they challenge... So again, this is Stellark, and then so... The three artists, they are related in the sense that they talk about how do they use technology to um, to make art. So as we can see, it's the digital manipulation, okay, with the computers that talks about a specific issue. But here, what he Sherlock does is he actually works with um, emotions and electronics. So here he created a third robotic arm and the arm is actually in itself writing the word evolution so that was the piece of artwork I suppose it's the whole performance aspect of it and the actual the writing evolution um, now is that art you know if it's not created by the artists themselves rather created by a machine is that art okay so we're gonna come back and talk a little bit, a little bit about that because in the past there is um, there are people like Michelangelo who never works alone. He works in a team, okay? And he has a lot of apprentices that would paint most the majority of the parts of his works and and what he'll do is he'll come back and do do you know the final touches, you know, and he's considered the master of that particular piece. Um, so it's not so unusual having somebody else that's not the person themselves creating the art being called a piece of art or, or an artist. So in this case, Sterlach is trying to challenge the idea of, well, you know, I made the machine, um, the machine is making now this, is this art? Okay. What about wearables? Are they considered art? Okay. A different type of wearable. This is a, a bra made out of television. Is this, is this art? And this bra was actually worn by a famous um, celloist called Charlotte Mormon, and she was also performing in this TV. 
Now you have to understand, this is quite ahead of its time. It was made in the 1960s, and at the time, um, you know, using technology to create art is a new frontier. Object art. What about this? Is this art? It's challenging the notion of why the is used. It confuses the person who's using it. You know, so thinking about material, what sort of materials do we use? What about this? Which one's art? The troll doll or the sculpture by P Patricia Piccinini, which looks a little eerie, doesn't it? And that's the main purpose of her works is to talk about biology and to make people feel grotesque about her work deliberately. Oh, and there is that lady again, sorry for repeating the slide. Um, what about this? It's a video by Bill Viola. All right, I think that comes to the end of that little game section. Um, now, we've seen a lot of examples and all the examples I've been trying to show you so far are people who try to challenge the notion of art, which brings us to the idea of postmodernism. What is postmodernism? All right, so it is a movement that goes through um, theories of literature, politics, philosophy and art. Now what I really want us to start thinking about is, because this is the time that we're living in, so we can actually start questioning things with a twist. You know, how have these people challenged what's happening at the time? How does this associate with how we think today? Okay. So, oops. So, I think, I suppose the most important thing is um, postmodernism rejects the idea of absolute truth and universal laws. So, in modernism, people only think very leniently, whereas postmodernism, we tend to reflect on ideas, just like how we are learning in class. Okay. So, this, I'll just leave this up here very, very briefly. You can just read it yourself. Um, it started, um, you know, modernism. There is, like, technical terms wise, there is a difference between modernism and postmodernism. Um, postmodernism started around World War II. Okay. And with this man called Nietzsche. He was the first person who declared the idea that God is dead. So he's trying to fight against the absolute truth because people think the truth is there is a God. And, um, and to question the relevance of God was a very radical concept of the time. Okay. So then because of this idea of challenging what historical values of what art is, then that brings us to the question again, what is art? Okay, as we were saying before, so historically what we understood as art is their paintings probably, or sculptures that's hung in galleries or palaces, okay? So it's art for wealthy people because those are the people who can enjoy culture, okay, or high culture, okay? So whereas things like graffitis or comics or, you know, are seen as kitsch. Have you heard of that word before? Kitsch. So it's childish. It's, uh, it's just entertainment. It's, um, you know, so in modernism, there has been attempt to construct a coherent worldview, whereas postmodernism attempts to remove the differences between the high art and the low art. What does that mean? So, because people only accepted art to be something much more grand, and now this is, you know, the turning point where things like comics, as we talked about, could be considered art. So this is Roy Lichtenstein. This is his paintings. This is actually rather large. He made little comic strip paintings into like you know four meter um, painting. So, again, we talked about Basquiat, remember the Mona Lisa that we um, saw before? So, 
he, again, he's from the 60s and he's trying to challenge the idea of what is art. You know, he's from the side of the street. He was a nobody when Andy Warhol found him or first found him or discovered him and then brought him to the high world of art where there's galleries and um, he was wearing the Armani suits then to paint. You know, the world turned totally upside down for him. He only drew like this on off on the street because he only had access to cardboard or very, very limited art materials because he was literally living in a cardboard box on the street. All right, so postmodernism challenges the established ideas of what is valuable and significant and what is not. And I think that's a very important thing for you to think about. So you'll question whether an opera by Mozart is any better than a three minute rap by some black 50 cent. Okay. They would also challenge who has the authority to make this judgment. And this is very, very important because have a little think about it in the past. Who gets to have a say of what is art? Think a little past as in like think people like, you know, the Renaissance with people that we all know, like Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. Who, who thinks their art passes, you know, a certain standard to be considered art? Who makes that decision? Did Michelangelo say, come up one day and say, well, my art is art and therefore it is art? Or did somebody else, you know, give them credit for saying, ah, he is the painter that I want and he is the best in this field? This I'm going to skip a little bit because we've already touched on this one. So the, it was just the word again, appropriation rather than copy. Um, so artists who work in a postmodernism way often appropriate images from other sources. Um, and in doing so, they have to and they must, must, must change the context. It's called recontextualization of an image that they see to create a new meaning. Because if they don't, then that's just a copy and that can get into a lot of different sort of troubles. So again, just retouching on this one, that's the Mona Lisa. Um, yeah, there's a little odd fact. Um, there's the Mona Lisa again, and she is the best example of um, how and why appropriation is used. Um, so you can see in the 80s, um, It was, sorry, so as you can see, I have actually got the years wrong in there. So, um, the Basquiat is by Mona Lisa in 1983, and um, the Duchamp is actually made in, I think, 1927. Um, so, there is a little bit of a gap in there, but they both try to appropriate the idea in a different time. And by appropriating, what they're doing is they're challenging the notion of the art. Why did they pick this particular image to use? Why do you think that? Perhaps is it because it's the most iconic image that represents the idea of art and they're trying to challenge the idea and the notions of that? Well, that's a little funny um, thing. The letters down the bottom says, in French, it sounds like that she has a hot ass. Again, again, you can see many different other interpretations of it. But now, when you look at different appropriations, are they just fun or are they actually considered a piece of art? So there is a little bit of a difference there. You can use an appropriation to take the meaning um, and to put it into a different context to change the meaning. But is it changed enough um, to make it art? That's a different question altogether. Um, now, I want to move on to the next section, which is who is an artist? Now, what do you think an artist do? Have a little think, give yourself a little minute just to think, well, what do artists do? They make art, okay? But at the same time, you know, what else do they do? I think they have to understand a lot of um, different ideas from around the world, especially living in this day and age, or, or especially living in this day and age where there are not just 
interpreting the world around them, but they are challenging the world around them. Um, often they also collaborate or meet with other artists as well. So artists often social belongings, you know, they work in groups, schools, studios, being part of an art movement, you know, um, they didn't say we're an art movement first, but they, they work in places and connect with other artists so that they can, um, so that they can um, learn and work together with them to create a little circle. Okay, so there are many definitions of art. Perhaps, you know, as many people who call themselves artists, trying to understand what art is can be exciting and a rich journey, but it's important to understand what art is for you. And this will ultimately shape how you view art and how you practice art. So a really helpful way to think about what art is, is to consider, you know, the big universal human themes that have inspired artists throughout history. So, you know, things from the geography of where they live in, the history, the culture, you know, so these are the obvious ones, to then emotions, you have joy, love, pain, you know, compassion, hatred, you know, these are all common to humanity. Okay, and then secondly, then you have to consider your unique experiences that no one else has experienced. Um, so a lot of these artists portray that in their artwork, you know, they are actually telling you a story about their own experience that no one else has experienced before and they seeing you know you're helping the artist is helping the audience see the world through their eyes okay so without further ado let's have a look at the next example you know who is an artist i've got several examples here you know and before i do that i want you to think about are they all considered artists and do they all create with a purpose? Okay, do you have to create with a purpose to be called an artist? I think to a certain extent, I think you do. Okay, because once you're looking at, um, when we're looking at quite a few of the examples before, you know, what differentiated between the ones that are considered, you know, by critics, by the audience today as an actual artworks, those have been created with a purpose. All right, so these are the artworks. Oops, that one is a little, gave a little bit away. Okay, these are the artworks, have a look at them. They are all quite abstract, I would say. Do you like them? We talked about the Jackson Pollock before. All right, um, so this was painted by an elephant in the zoo. This one's painted by Marla, who's four years old, lives in New York. She has her own documentary that talks about her coming into fame. This is Jackson Pollock, as we already talked about. And that's Congo. All right, so. Well, the elephant in a zoo in Thailand learnt how to paint elephants, I suppose. Um, and it's selling its works to tourists. I'm not really sure how much say does the elephant have in this. Uh, most likely a lot of other stakeholders, such as the zookeepers or people who are trying to make money from the zoo or benefit from the zoo. I, I would presume that they have a little bit more say than the elephants. Um, and then there is Marla. Um, she's been selling her work since 2003 and her highest offer has been $300,000 so far. Um, Sorry, that's the amount of money that she's made so far by the time she got to 2007. Now it's 19, uh, you know, 12 years from then, so she's doing pretty well for herself. There is the $1.3 million painting that was purchased in 1973, as we talked about before. And there is the painting by Congo is now this is quite interesting about it because it was sold in an auction for twenty six thousand dollars um but is the work any good you know but the work has been previously owned by picasso so if picasso had owned it and then they're reselling it that the history 
of where the painting has been that could add value to the artwork as well. So we, when we're talking about art, you know, who values art and what is considered art, sometimes value and money goes hand in hand. Not always, but quite often the case it does. And it's not something that we can, you know, um, it's not something that we can get away from. All right, so what about this statement? Art is not everything but we need it. I quite like this. This is graffiti um, somewhere near my house, actually, in Hong Kong. I really like the statement. When you explore an artistic piece, you need to do more than simply pass a verdict on whether you like it or not. So remember how I talked about there are different frames that we can look at, analyze an artwork. So We've looked at it from a subjective point of view, so whether you like it or not, because there's so many factors, whether you like it or not. Um, then there was the postmodern factor. Well, has it been challenged? How has it been challenged? Okay, so structurally, we can also look at things from a structural perspective. Um, how is it made? What is it made from? How is it made with? Was that, you know, on the cutting edge? you know, what sort of skills and techniques has been applied, so that's from a structural point of view. Um, we can look at that as well. And of course, the cultural perspective that we've mentioned right from the beginning, because that's something that we can never get away from. We've always, we're always influenced by where we come from and who we are. Um, this is actually a quite a funny piece. I've actually put it in here because this is in a gallery where I used to work and, um, and the teacher thought one of the kids came around and actually broke it and they actually apologized. Now, because we talked about the notion of art having monetary value, whether we like it or not, then who is judging it? And how do we know the critic is honest and valid? Okay. So first thing we need to know that is that there are many different people involved in the art world. So we've talked about this artist and then the audience. Who are the audience? Okay, so there are people, patrons, who we've talked about that would um, fund people like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci to, um, to make artworks. So those are patrons. Um, they're artists. Okay. Oh. Sorry. I'm a little off tangent here, so sorry. There's uh, the the artist that we talked about, and then there, who's the people that's making the artwork, okay? And we've talked about, you know, do they work by themselves or do they work in a team? And then who does the artwork get credited to? So this is a, a diamond skull, a real human skull, for eighty million dollars sold um, in two thousand and eight. Another controversial work. He is the same man who made, as you remember, the shark that we saw before, the shark in the tank of Falmagahide. Alright, so the creative practical decisions that artists make as their work are influenced by many factors, such as the ideas that they make with art. Okay, the way other people value the work of artists might also impact on the way, on the way the artist works. So it feeds on each other, that means. Okay, there are people called art theorists. Have you heard of them before? What do they do? What do art theorists do? And, um, and then they are slightly different to what art critics do. So art theorists develop theories of what they think art is. Usually it's a little bit more historic, okay? They, um, they kind of have a look at what's current around them and then they make sense of. So for example, ah, I have a theory about why this group of people is creating this type of art today. So that's what they do. That differs to art historians. Art historians um, looks back at what people used to make and then they come up and revise the history of how and why these people have been great. So they discover people and they write about them in that way. So let me have a little look here also. Um,
so they um sorry so i'm just looking over my notes so these include when they're writing they include cultural knowledge and scientific understanding and for the arts for example um, they would write about things like architecture art um, craft objects music literature you know they give us evidence of how to understand the human history and insight into the changes that have taken place in the wider range of areas okay so they offer a window on the history of the world and they use and the way that they write they look into the past lens using the current it's a little confusing so they use how they start the current lens um, of how they think today and they write about the past just like how history gets revised they do the same so they um, they can actually help promote a lot of artists works and um, make or break them as well okay so what maybe in the past somebody might not consider ah as a good example actually in the past for example the critics at the time for um, the impressionist group of people and said that they're not very good artists um, they don't know what they're doing but as in hindsight art historians come back and give them credit to say oh, wait a minute but if you're looking at this as a whole movement it is a very successful movement therefore they should be recognized and praised so that's their job and that's their role art critics can make or break people as you can see um, and artists one of their roles is to you know sometimes have to suck it up and really listen and have to hear you know what these people have to say and stay tough you know um, because you can't always listen to what critics have to say about your work and change from there because there's just so many different opinions about your works and sometimes people there are critics that don't agree with each other and that happens quite often actually as well and they openly argue in newspaper columns as well so you know a good critic they will analyze work from the technical perspective rather than their subjective perspective also i mean that's a little hard to get away from but you know people try to do that they'll also try to consider the cultural context of where it's made and how it's made um in terms of the place and the time so then that gives it context and um and looking at the artist's intentions again was it made with a purpose okay and the the work served the purpose um and of course the professional art critics who work within the constraints of their employments have specific audiences in their mind when they're preparing for the critiques and i think that's what makes a lot of these critiques very biased is because i think sometimes they're right for a certain group of audience that they try to please or get more news and get yeah so i think this is a little controversial i think when people start doing that Mm, you know so I can just move on from this one because you can read this yourself you know so the reviews um, can be found in different sort of places um, and then there are different types of critics sometimes um, because they talk about different things so some talk about you know the philosophy of what is art whereas other ones makes critical statement about like you know buying works why we should be buying and not buying these particular people's works um, to you know people who are curating at the galleries or art books or documentaries so they can give their opinions about um exhibitions or the books or um or videos um but what they do have common is they give a value okay to the artwork so for example going back to this example of Roy Lichtenstein if it wasn't and it hadn't been a critic that says that this is a very bold attempt and this should be considered art I don't think people would turn an eye just to think this is a great and amazing piece of artwork at the time okay um so then there are some other people that might factor this but I'm not going to have time to talk about this for now but then there are curators okay 
so people who work in the galleries and how they put together the exhibitions they might have their own political agenda as to say if this gets put on therefore it must be good right or art dealers people who work for art auctions or how much did the actual auction has gone on for and the patrons and people who pay people to make money for example like Damien Hirst that we saw with the shark with the skull a lot of his works were supported it they were not commissioned so they were not paid to make that specific work but they were given money and being supported backed by very wealthy people to allow him to make um, extravagant sort of art okay so all these you know all these factors gives a value to the actual art itself so we're not really we're moving a little bit away from what is what isn't art because then to well hard to say it's been given a value to what people is con like you know ha has considered it as art already that's when people start want to invest money into it and i think that's what gives an art a bit of a value so for example here it's actually one of my um favorite painters it's by uh, lucian freud um who's sigmund freud's grandson um this one was one of his paintings and um, it was sold for $33.6 million um, and that made it the world's most expensive painting um, at an auction. Um, I think, but this was a few years ago so I'm not really 100% sure what's the current most expensive painting but I know up till a few years ago 33.6 million dollars this is the most expensive painting sold all right so this is my last slide so alternatively it may be in terms of cultural value as well so what I'm trying to say is here the price of how much art is worth also may depend on the culture not just on um, not just on the techniques or not just on how um how much people can bid for it and so on and so forth all right all right so i think this comes to the end of it i hope you've enjoyed that this hopefully opens up a lot more questions for you to bring up to class this would be a lot more enjoyable as a um as a class discussion rather than rather than um just me talking i just don't find this fun just talking but um, write some questions down. Um, I really, really want to discuss this further when we get to class in Bilbao. All right, see you soon, guys.